Letters of Christopher Columbus relating to his four voyages to the so-called New World. You can find the text or this book online at this address. And this book was published by the Hucklite Society, a publication society based in London, established in 1846. And one of their specialties is printing primary materials, including accounts of voyages, travel journals, letters, maps, and anything related to geography especially those primary materials compiled during the age of exploration, which means when Europeans began to learn about the world, but the places they found were already populated, as we will see. And the so-called age of exploration begins in the late 15th century, but continues strongly through the 17th century. I'll be reading from the works by R.H. Major, who translated and edited the text I'm about to read. Select Letters of Christopher Columbus. First Voyage of Columbus, a letter sent by Columbus to Luis de Santangel, Chancellor of the Exchequer of Aragon, respecting the islands found in the Indies and closing another for their highness. Sir, believing that you will take pleasure in hearing of the great success which our Lord has granted me in my voyage, I write you this letter whereby you will learn how in 33 days' time I reached the Indies with the fleet which the most illustrious king and queen, our sovereigns, gave to me, where I found very many islands thickly peopled, of all which I took possession without resistance for their highnesses, by proclamation made and with the royal standard unfurled. To the first island that I found, I gave the name of San Salvador, in remembrance of his high majesty, who hath marvelously brought all these things to pass. The Indians call it Guanaam. To the second island, I gave the name of Santa Maria de Concepcion. The third, I called Ferdinanda. The fourth, Isabella. The fifth, Juana. And so to each one, I gave a new name. When I reached Juana, I followed its coast to the westward and found it so large that I thought it must be the mainland, the province of Cathay. And as I found neither towns nor villages on the sea coast, but only a few hamlets with the inhabitants of which I could not hold conversation because they all immediately fled, I kept on the same route, thinking that I could not fail to light upon some large cities and towns. At length, after the proceeding of many leagues, and finding that nothing new presented itself, and that the coast was leading me northwards, which I wished to avoid because winter had already set in, and it was my intention to move southwards, and because, moreover, the winds were contrary, I resolved not to wait for a change in the weather, but returned to a certain harbor which I had remarked, and from which I sent two men ashore to ascertain whether there was any king or large cities in that part. They journeyed for three days and found countless small hamlets with numberless inhabitants, but with nothing like order. They therefore returned. In the meantime, I had learned from some other Indians whom I had seized that this land was certainly an island. Accordingly, I followed the coast eastward for a distance of 107 leagues, where it ended in a cape. From this cape, I saw another island to the eastward at a distance of 18 leagues from the former, to which I gave the name La Española. Thither, I went and followed its northern coast to the eastward, just as I had done with the coast of Juana, 178 full leagues due east. This island, like all the others, is extraordinarily large, and this one extremely so. In it are many seaports, with which none that I know in Christendom can bear comparison, so good and capacious that it is wonder to see. The lands are high, and there are many very lofty mountains with which the island of Setefre cannot be compared. They are all most beautiful, of a thousand different shapes, accessible, and covered with trees of a thousand kinds of such great height that they seem to reach the skies. 
I am told that the trees never lose their foliage, and I can well understand it, for I observed that they were as green and luxuriant as in Spain in the month of May. Some were in bloom, others bearing fruit, and others otherwise according to their nature. The nightingale was singing as well as other birds of a thousand different kinds, and that in November, the month in which I myself was roaming amongst them. There are palm trees of six or eight kinds, wonderful in their beautiful variety. But this is the case with all the other trees and fruits and grasses. Trees, plants, or fruits filled us with admiration. It contains extraordinary pine groves and very extensive plains. There is also honey, a great variety of birds, and many different kinds of fruits. In the interior, there are many mines of metals and a population innumerable. Española is a wonder. Its mountains and plains and meadows and fields are so beautiful and rich for planting and sowing and rearing cattle of all kinds and for building towns and villages. The harbors on the coast and the number and size and wholesomeness of the rivers, most of them bearing gold, surpass anything that would be believed by one who had not seen them. There is a great difference between the trees, fruits, and plants of this island and those of Juana. In this island, there are many spices and extensive mines of gold and other metals. The inhabitants of this and of all the other islands I have found or gained intelligence of, both men and women, go as naked as they were born, with the exception that some of the women cover one part only with a single leaf of grass or with a piece of cotton made for that purpose. They have neither iron nor steel nor arms, nor are they competent to use them. Not that they are not well formed and of handsome stature, but because they are timid to a surprising degree. Their only arms are reeds cut in the seeding time, to which they fasten small sharpened sticks, and even these they dare not use. For on several occasions it has happened that I have sent ashore two or three men to some village to hold a parley and the people have come out in countless numbers. But as soon as they saw our men approach, would flee with such precipitation that a father would not even stop to protect his son. And this not because any harm had been done to any of them, for from the first, whenever I went and got speech with them, I gave them of all that I had, such as cloth and many other things without receiving anything in return. But they are, as I have described, incurably timid. It is true that when they are reassured and have thrown off this fear, they are guileless and so liberal of all they have that no one would believe it who had not seen it. They never refuse anything that they possess when it is asked of them. On the contrary, they offer it themselves and they exhibit so much loving kindness that they would even give their hearts. And whether it be something of value or of little worth that is offered to them, they are satisfied. I forbade that worthless things such as pieces of broken porringers and broken glass and ends of straps should be given to them. Although when they succeeded in obtaining them, they thought they possessed the finest jewel in the world. It was ascertained that a sailor received for a leather strap a piece of gold weighing two castellanos and a half, and others received for other objects of far less value much more. For new blancas, they would give all that they had, whether it was two or three castellanos in gold or one or two arrobas of spun cotton. They took even bits of the broken hoops of the wine barrels and gave, like fools, all that they possessed in exchange, insomuch that I thought it was wrong and forbade it. I gave away a thousand good and pretty articles which I had brought with me in order to win their affection, and that they might be led to become Christians and be well inclined to love and serve their highnesses and the whole Spanish nation, and that they might aid us by giving us 
things of which we stand in need, but which they possess in abundance. They are not acquainted with any kind of worship and are not idolaters, but believe that all power and indeed all good things are in heaven. And they are firmly convinced that I, with my vessels and crews, came from heaven and with this belief received me at every place at which I touched after they had overcome their apprehension. And this does not spring from ignorance, for they are very intelligent and navigate all these seas and relate everything to us, so that it is astonishing what a good account they are able to give of everything. But they have never seen men with clothes on nor vessels like ours. On my reaching the Indies, I took by force in the first island that I discovered some of these natives, that they might learn our language and give me information in regard to what existed in these parts. And it so happened that they soon understood us, and we them, either by words or signs, and they have been very serviceable to us. They are still with me, and from repeated conversations that I have had with them, I find that they still believe that I come from heaven, and they were the first to say this wherever I went. And the others ran from house to house and to the neighboring villages, crying with a loud voice, Come, come and see the peoples from heaven. And thus they all, men as well as women, after their minds were at rest about us, came, both large and small, and brought us something to eat and drink, which they gave us with extraordinary kindness. They have in all these islands very many canoes, like our rowboats, some larger, some smaller, but most of them larger than a barge of 18 seats. They are not so wide because they are made of one single piece of timber, but a barge could not keep up with them in rowing because they go with incredible speed. And with these canoes, they navigate among these islands, which are innumerable, and carry on their traffic. I have seen in some of these canoes 70 and 80 men, each with his oar. In all these islands, I did not notice much difference in the appearance of the inhabitants, nor in their manners nor language, except that they all understand each other, which is very singular, and leads me to hope that their highnesses will take means for their conversion to our holy faith, towards which they are very well disposed. I have already said how I had gone 107 leagues in following the sea coast of Juana in a straight line from west to east, and from that survey, I can state that the island is larger than England and Scotland together, because beyond these 107 leagues, there lie to the west two provinces which I have not yet visited, one of which is called Avan, where the people are born with a tail. These two provinces cannot be less in length than from 50 to 60 leagues, from what can be learned from the Indians that are with me, and who are acquainted with all these islands. The other Española has a greater circumference than all Spain, from Catalonia by the sea coast to Fuenterrabia in Biscay, since on one of its four sides I made 188 great leagues in a straight line from west to east. This is something to covet, and when found, not to be lost sight of. Although I have taken possession of all these islands in the name of their highnesses, and they are all more abundant in wealth than I am able to express, and although I hold them all for their highnesses, so that they can dispose of them quite as absolutely as they can of the kingdom of Castile. Yet there was one large town in Española, of which especially I took possession, situated in a locality well adapted for the working of the gold mines and for all kinds of commerce, either with the main land on this side or with that beyond which is the land of the great Khan, with which there will be vast commerce and great profit. To that city I gave the name of Villa de Navidad and fortified it with a fortress, which by this time will be quite completed, and I have left in it a sufficient number of men with arms, artillery, and provisions for more than a year, a barge, and a sailing master skillful in the arts necessary for building others. I have also established the greatest friendship with the king of that country, so much so 
that he took pride in calling me his brother and treating me as such. Even should these people change their intentions towards us and become hostile, they do not know what arms are, but, as I have said, go naked and are the most timid people in the world, so that the men I have left could alone destroy the whole country. And this island has no danger for them if they only know how to conduct themselves. In all those islands, it seems to me that the men are content with one wife, except their chief or king, to whom they give twenty. The women seem to me to work more than the men. I have not been able to learn whether they have any property of their own. It seemed to me that what one possessed belonged to all, especially in the matter of edibles. I have not found in those islands any monsters as many imagined, but on the contrary, the whole race is very well formed, nor are they black as in Guinea, but their hair is flowing, for they do not dwell in that part where the force of the sun's rays is too powerful. It is true that the sun has very great power there, for the country is distant only 26 degrees from the equinoctial line. In the islands where there are high mountains, the cold this winter was very great, but they endured it, not only from being habituated to it, but by eating meat with a variety of excessively hot spices. As to savages, I did not even hear of any, except at an island which lies the second in one's way in coming to the Indies. It is inhabited by a race which is regarded throughout these islands as extremely ferocious and eaters of human flesh. These possess many canoes in which they visit all the Indian islands and rob and plunder whatever they can. They are no worse formed than the rest, except that they are in the habit of wearing their hair long like women and use bows and arrows made of reeds with a small stick at the end for want of iron which they do not possess. They are ferocious amongst these exceedingly timid people, but I think no more of them than of the rest. These are they which have intercourse with the women of Matenino, the first island one comes to on the way from Spain to the Indies, and in which there are no men. These women employ themselves in no labor suitable to their sex, but use bows and arrows made of reeds like those above described, and arm and cover themselves with plates of copper, of which metal they have a great quantity. They assure me that there is another island larger than Española in which the inhabitants have no hair. It is extremely rich in gold, and I bring with me Indians taken from these islands who will testify to all these things. Finally, and speaking only of what has taken place in this voyage, which has been so hasty, their highnesses may see that I shall give them all the gold they require, if they will give me but a very little assistance. Spices also, and cotton, as much as their highnesses shall command to be shipped, and mastic hitherto found only in Greece, in the island of Chios, and which the Signoria sells at its own price as much as their highnesses shall command to be shipped. Line aloes, as much as their highnesses shall command to be shipped. Slaves, as many of these idolaters, as their highnesses shall command to be shipped. I think also I have found rhubarb and cinnamon, and I shall find a thousand other valuable things by means of the men that I have left behind me. For I tarried at no point so long as the wind allowed me to proceed, except in the town of Navidad, where I took the necessary precautions for the security and settlement of the men I left there. Much more I would have done if my vessels had been in as good a condition as by rights they ought to have been. This is much, and praised be the eternal God, our Lord, who gives to all those who walk in his ways victory over things which seem impossible, of which this is signally one. For although others may have spoken or written concerning these countries, it was all mere conjecture. 
as no one could say that he had seen them. It amounting only to this, that those who heard listened the more and regarded the matter rather as a fable than anything else. But our Redeemer hath granted this victory to our illustrious King and Queen and their kingdoms, which have acquired great fame by an event of such high importance in which all Christendom ought to rejoice and which it ought to celebrate with great festivals and the offering of solemn thanks to the Holy Trinity with many solemn prayers, both for the great exaltation which may accrue to them in turning so many nations to our holy faith, and also for the temporal benefits which will bring great refreshment and gain not only to Spain, but to all Christians. This, thus briefly, in accordance with the events, done on board the caravel off the Canary Islands on the 15th of February, 1493, at your orders, the Admiral. And then it says, After this letter was written, as I was in the Sea of Castile, there arose a southwest wind, which compelled me to lighten my vessels and run this day into this port of Lisbon, an event which I consider the most marvelous thing in the world, and whence I resolved to write to their highnesses. In all the Indies, I have always found the weather like that in the month of May. I reached them in 33 days and returned in 28, with the exception that those storms detained me 14 days knocking about in this sea. All seamen say that they have never seen such a severe winter, nor so many vessels lost. Done on the 14th day of March. Second Voyage of Columbus. A letter addressed to the chapter of Seville by Dr. Chanka, native of that city and physician to the fleet of Columbus in his second voyage to the West Indies, describing the principal events which occurred during that voyage. Most noble sir, since the occurrences which I relate in private letters to other persons are not of such general interest as those which are contained in this epistle, I have resolved to give you a distinct narrative of the events of our voyage, as well as to treat of the other matters which form the subject of my petition to you. The news I have to communicate are as follows. The expedition which their Catholic Majesty sent by divine permission from Spain to the Indies, under the command of Christopher Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean, left Cadiz on the 25th of September of the year, the footnote says, 1493, with wind and weather favorable for the voyage. This wind lasted two days, during which time we managed to make nearly 50 leagues. The weather then changing, we made little or no progress for the next two days. It pleased God, however, after this, to restore us fine weather, so that in two days more we reached the Great Canary. Here we put into harbor, which we were obliged to do, to repair one of the ships, which made a great deal of water. We remained all that day, and on the following set sail again, but were several times becalmed, so that we were four or five days before we reached Gomera. We had to remain at Gomera one day to lay in our stores of meat, wood, and as much water as we could stow, preparatory to the long voyage which we expected to make without seeing land. Thus, through the delay at these two ports and being calmed the day after leaving Gomera, we were 19 or 20 days before we arrived at the island of Ferro. After this, we had, by the goodness of God, a return of fine weather, more continuous than any fleet ever enjoyed during so long a voyage, so that leaving Ferro on the 13th of October, within 20 days, we came in sight of land, and we should have seen it in 14 or 15 days if the ship Capitana had been as good a sailor as the other vessels. For many times, the others had to shorten sail because they were leaving us much behind. During all this time, we had great good fortune, for throughout the voyage, we encountered no storm, with the exception of one on St. Simon's Eve, which for four hours 
put us in considerable jeopardy. On the first Sunday after All Saints, namely the 3rd of November, about dawn, a pilot of the ship Capitana cried out, The reward! I see the land! The joy of the people was so great that it was wonderful to hear their cries and exclamations of pleasure. And they had good reason to be delighted, for they had become so wearied of bad living and of working the water out of the ships that all sighed most anxiously for land. The pilots of the fleet reckoned on that day that between leaving Ferro and first reaching land, we had made 800 leagues. Others said 780, so that the difference was not great, and 300 more between Ferro and Cadiz, making in all 1,100 leagues. I do not, therefore, feel as one who had not seen enough of the water. On the morning of the aforesaid Sunday, we saw lying before us an island, and soon on the right hand another appeared. The first was high and mountainous on the side nearest to us, the other flat and very thickly wooded. As soon as it became lighter, other islands began to appear on both sides, so that on that day, there were six islands to be seen lying in different directions, and most of them of considerable size. We directed our course towards that which we had first seen, and reaching the coast, we proceeded more than a league in search of a port where we might anchor. But without finding one, all that part of the island which met our view appeared mountainous, very beautiful, and green even up to the water, which was delightful to see. For at that season, there is scarcely anything green in our own country. When we found that there was no harbor there, the admiral decided that we should go to the other island, which appeared on the right, and which was at four or five leagues distance. One vessel, however, still remained on the first island, all that day seeking for a harbor in case it should be necessary to return thither. At length, having found a good one where they saw both people and dwellings, they returned that night to the fleet, which had put into harbor at the other island. And there the admiral, accompanied by a great number of men, landed with a royal banner in his hands and took formal possession on behalf of their majesties. This island was filled with an astonishingly thick growth of wood, the variety of unknown trees, some bearing fruit and some flowers, was surprising. And indeed, every spot was covered with verdure. We found there a tree whose leaf had the finest smell of cloves that I had ever met with. It was like a laurel leaf, but not so large. But I think it was a species of laurel. There were wild fruits of various kinds, some of which our men, not very prudently, tasted. And upon only touching them with their tongues, their countenances became inflamed. And such great heat and pain followed that they seemed to be mad and were obliged to resort to refrigerants to cure themselves. We found no signs of any people in this island and concluded it was uninhabited. We remained only two hours for it was very late when we landed, and on the following morning we left for another very large island. Situated below this, at the distance of seven or eight leagues, we approached it under the side of a great mountain that seemed almost to reach the skies, in the middle of which rose a peak higher than all the rest of the mountain, whence many streams diverged into different channels, especially towards the part at which we arrived. At three leagues distance, we could see an immense fall of water, which looked of the breath of an ox, and discharged itself from such a height that it appeared to fall from the sky. It was seen from so great a distance that it occasioned many wagers to be laid on board the ships, some maintaining that it was but a series of white rocks, and others that it was water. When we came nearer to it, it showed itself distinctly and it was the most beautiful thing in the world to see from how great a height and from what a small space so large a fall of water was discharged. As soon as we neared the island, 
the Admiral ordered a light caravel to run along the coast to search for a harbor. The captain put into land in a boat and seeing some houses, leapt on shore and went up to them, the inhabitants fleeing at sight of our men. He then went into the houses and there found various household articles that had been left unremoved from which he took two parrots, very large and quite different from any we had before seen. He found a great quantity of cotton, both spun and prepared for spinning, and articles of food, of all of which he brought away a portion. Besides these, he also brought away four or five bones of human arms and legs. On seeing these, we suspected that we were among the Caribbean islands whose inhabitants eat human flesh. For the admiral, guided by the information respecting their situation, which he had received from the Indians of the islands discovered in his former voyage, had directed his course with a view to their discovery, both because they were the nearest to Spain and because this was the direct track for the island of Española, where he had left some of his people. Thither, by the goodness of God and the wise management of the admiral, we came in as straight a track as if we had sailed by a well-known and frequented route. This island is very large, and on the side where we arrived, it seemed to us to be 25 leagues in length. We sailed more than two leagues along the shore in search of a harbor. On the part towards which we moved appeared very high mountains and on that which we left extensive plains. On the sea coast, there were few small villages whose inhabitants fled as soon as they saw the sails. At length, after proceeding two leagues, we found a port late in the evening. That night, the admiral resolved that some of the men should land at break of day in order to confer with the natives and learn what sort of people they were, although it was suspected from the appearance of those who had fled at our approach that they were naked, like those whom the admiral had seen in his former voyage. In the morning, several detachments under their respective captains sallied forth. One of them returned at the dinner hour with a boy of about 14 years of age, as it afterwards appeared, who said that he was one of the prisoners taken by these people. The others divided themselves, and one party took a little boy whom a man was leading by the hand, but who left him and fled. This boy they sent on board immediately with some of our men. Others remained and took certain women, natives of the island, together with other women from among the captives who came of their own accord. One captain of this last company, not knowing, that any intelligence of the people had been obtained, advanced farther into the island and lost himself with the six men who accompanied him. They could not find their way back until after four days when they lighted upon the seashore and following the line of coast, returned to the fleet. We had already looked upon them as killed and eaten by the people that are called Caribbees for we could not account for their long absence in any other way, since they had among them some pilots who by their knowledge of the stars could navigate either to or from Spain, so that we imagined that they could not lose themselves in so small a space. On this first day of our landing, several men and women came on the beach up to the water's edge and gazed at the ships in astonishment at so novel a sight. And when a boat pushed on shore in order to speak with them, they cried out, Taino, Taino, which is as much as to say good, and waited for the landing of the sailors standing by the boat in such a manner that they might escape when they pleased. The result was that none of the men could be persuaded to join us, and only two were taken by force, who were secured and led away. More than 20 of the female captives were taken with their own consent and other women natives of the island were surprised and carried off. Several of the boys who were captives came to us fleeing from the natives of the island who had taken them prisoners. We remained eight days in this port in consequence of the loss of the aforesaid captain. 
and went many times on shore, passing amongst the dwellings and villages which were on the coast. We found a vast number of human bones and skulls hung up about the houses, like vessels intended for holding various things. There were very few men to be seen here, and the women informed us that this was in consequence of ten canoes having gone to make an attack upon other islands. These islanders appeared to us to be more civilized than those we had hitherto seen. For although all the Indians have houses of straw, yet the houses of these people are constructed in a much superior fashion, are better stocked with provisions, and exhibit more evidence of industry, both on the part of the men and the women. They had a considerable quantity of cotton, both spun and prepared for spinning, and many cotton sheets so well woven as to be no way inferior to those of our country. We inquired of the women who were prisoners in the island what people these islanders were. They replied that they were Caribbees. As soon as they learned that we abhorred such people on account of the evil practice of eating human flesh, they were much delighted. And after that, if they brought forward any woman or man of the Caribbees, they informed us, but secretly, that they were such, still evincing by their dread of their conquerors that they belonged to a vanquished nation, though they knew them all to be in our power. We were enabled to distinguish which of the women were natives and which were captives by the Caribbees wearing on each leg two bands of woven cotton, the one fastened round the knee and the other round the ankle. By this means, they make the calves of their legs large, and the above-mentioned parts very small, which I imagine that they regard as a matter of prettiness. By this peculiarity, we distinguished them. The habits of these Caribbees are brutal. There are three islands, the one called Turuqueira, the other, which was the first that we saw, is called Seide. The third is called Ayai. There is a resemblance among the natives of all these, as if they were one race, and they do no injury to each other. But each and all of them wage war against the other neighboring islands, and for the purpose of attacking them, make voyages of a hundred and fifty leagues at sea, with their numerous canoes, which are a small kind of craft made out of a single trunk of a tree. Their arms are arrows in the place of iron weapons, and as they have no iron, some of them point their arrows with tortoise shell, and others make their arrowheads of fish spines, which are naturally barbed like coarse saws. These prove dangerous weapons to a naked people like the Indians, and may cause death or severe injury. But to men of our nation, they are not very formidable. In their attacks upon the neighboring islands, these people capture as many of the women as they can, especially those who are young and beautiful, and keep them as concubines. In so great a number do they carry off that in fifty houses no men were to be seen, and out of the number of the captives more than twenty were young girls. These women also say that the Caribbees use them with such cruelty as would scarcely be believed, and that they eat the children which they bear to them, and only bring up those which they have by their native wives. Such of their male enemies as they can take alive, they bring to their houses to make a feast of them, and those who are killed they devour at once. They say that man's flesh is so good that there is nothing like it in the world. And this is pretty evident, for of the bones which we found in their houses, they had gnawed everything that could be gnawed, so that nothing remained of them but what was too tough to be eaten. In one of the houses, we found the neck of a man undergoing the process of cooking in a pot. When they take any boys prisoners, they dismember them and make use of them until they grow up to manhood. And then, when they wish to make a feast, they kill and eat them. For they say that the flesh of boys and women is not good to eat. 
three of these boys came fleeing to us, thus mutilated. At the end of four days arrived the captain, who had lost himself with his companions, of whose return we had by this time given up all hope. For other parties had been twice sent out to seek him, one of which came back on the same day that he rejoined us, without having gained any information respecting the wanderers. We rejoiced at their arrival, regarding it as a new accession to our numbers. The captain and the men who accompanied him brought back some women and boys, ten in number. Neither this party nor those who went out to seek them had seen any of the men of the island, which must have arisen either from their having fled or possibly from there being but very few men in that locality. For, as the women informed us, ten canoes had gone away to make an attack upon the neighboring islands. The wanderers had returned from the mountains in such an emaciated condition that it was distressing to see them. When we asked them how it was that they lost themselves, they said that the trees were so thick and close that they could not see the sky. Some of them, who were mariners, had climbed the trees to get a sight of the stars, but could never see them. And if they had not found their way to the sea coast, it would have been impossible to have returned to the fleet. We left this island eight days after our arrival. The next day at noon, we saw another island, not very large, at about 12 leagues distance from the one we were leaving. The greater part of the first day of our departure, we were kept close in to the coast of this island by a calm. But as the Indian women whom we brought with us said that it was not inhabited, but had been dispeopled by the Caribbees, we made no stay in it. On that evening, we saw another island. And in the night, finding there were some sandbanks near, we dropped anchor not venturing to proceed until the morning. On the morrow, another island appeared of considerable size, but we touched at none of these because we were anxious to convey consolation to our people who had been left in Española. But it did not please God to grant us our desire, as will hereafter appear. Another day at the dinner hour, we arrived at an island which seemed worth the finding, for judging by the extent of cultivation in it, it appeared very populous. We went thither and put into harbor, when the admiral immediately sent on shore a well-manned barge to hold speech with the Indians, in order to ascertain what race they were, and also because it was necessary to gain some information respecting our course although it afterwards plainly appeared that the admiral, who had never made that passage before, had taken a very correct route. But as matters of doubt should always be brought to as great a certainty as possible, by inquiry, he wished the natives to be communicated with, and some of the men who went in the barge landed and went up to a village, whence the inhabitants had already withdrawn and hidden themselves. They took in this island five or six women and some boys, most of whom were captives, like those in the other island. For, as we learned from the women whom we had brought with us, the natives of this place also were Caribbees. As this barge was about to return to the ships, with the capture which they had made, a canoe came along the coast, containing four men, two women, and a boy. And when they saw the fleet, they were so stupefied with amazement that for a good hour they remained motionless at the distance of nearly two gunshots from the ships. In this position, they were seen by those who were in the barge and also by all the fleet. Meanwhile, those in the barge moved towards the canoe, but so close in shore that the Indians, in their perplexity and astonishment, as to what all this could mean, never saw them, until they were so near that escape was impossible. For our men pressed on them so rapidly that they could not get away, although they made considerable effort to do so. When the Caribbees saw that all attempt at flight was useless, they most courageously took to their bows, both women and men, 
I say most courageously because they were only four men and two women, and our people were twenty-five in number. Two of our men were wounded by the Indians. One with two arrow shots in his breast, and another with one in his side. And if it had not happened that they carried shields and wooden bucklers, and that they soon got near them with a barge and upset their canoe, most of them would have been killed with their arrows. After their canoe was upset, they remained in the water swimming and occasionally waiting, for there were shallows in that part. Still using their bows as much as they could, so that our men had enough to do to take them. And after all, there was one of them whom they were unable to secure till he had received a mortal wound with a lance, and whom thus wounded they took to the ships. The difference between these Caribbees and the other Indians with respect to dress consists in their wearing their hair very long, while the others have it clipped irregularly. And paint their heads with crosses and a hundred thousand different devices, each according to his fancy, which they do with sharpened reeds. All of them, both the Caribbees and the others, are beardless, so that it is a rare thing to find a man with a beard. The Caribbees, whom we took, had their eyes and eyebrows stained, which I imagine they do from ostentation. It gave them a more formidable appearance. One of these captives said that in an island belonging to them called Care, which is the first that we saw, though we did not go to it, there is a great quantity of gold, and that if we were to take them nails and tools with which to make their canoes, we might bring away as much gold as we liked. On the same day we left that island, having been there no more than six or seven hours, and steering for another point of land which appeared to lie in our intended course we reached it by night on the morning of the following day we coasted along it and found it to be a large extent of country but not continuous for it was divided into more than forty islets the land was very high and most of it barren an appearance which we had never observed in any of the islands visited by us before or since the surface of the ground seemed to suggest the probability of it containing metals. None of us went on shore here, but a small Latin caravel went up to one of the islets and found in it some fishermen's huts. The Indian women whom we brought with us said they were not inhabited. We proceeded along the coast the greater part of that day and on the evening of the next, we discovered another island called Budenken, which we judged to be 30 leagues in length, for we were coasting along it the whole of one day. This island is very beautiful and apparently fertile. Hither, the Caribbees come with a view of subduing the inhabitants and often carry away many of the people. These islanders have no boats nor any knowledge of navigation, but, as our captives inform us, they use bows as well as the Caribbees, and, if by chance, when they are attacked, they succeed in taking any of their invaders, they will eat them in like manner as the Caribbees themselves, in the contrary event, would devour them. We remained two days in this island, and a great number of our men went on shore but could never get speech of the natives who had fled from fear of the Caribbees. All the above-mentioned islands were discovered in this voyage, the admiral having seen nothing of them in his former voyage. They are all very beautiful and possess a most luxuriant soil, but this last island appeared to exceed all the others in beauty. Here terminated the islands, which on the side toward Spain had not been seen before by the admiral, although we regard it as a matter of certainty that there is land more than 40 leagues beyond the foremost of these newly discovered islands on the side nearest to Spain. We believe this to be the case because two days before we saw land, we observed some birds called rabiorcados 
or pelicans, marine birds of prey, which do not sit or sleep upon the water, making circumvolutions in the air at the close of evening, previous to taking their flight towards land for the night. These birds could not be going to settle at more than 12 or 15 leagues distance because it was late in the evening and this was on a right hand on the side towards Spain, from which we all judged that there was land there still undiscovered. But we did not go in search of it because it would have taken us round out of our intended route. I hope that in a few voyages it will be discovered. It was at dawn that we left the before-mentioned island of Burenken. And on that day, before nightfall, we caught sight of land, which though not recognized by any of those who had come hither in the former voyage, we believed to be Española. From the information given us by the Indian women whom we had with us, and in this island we remain at present. Between it and Burenken, another island appeared at a distance, but of no great size. When we reached Española the land, at the part where we approached it was low and very flat, on seeing which a general doubt arose as to its identity, for neither the admiral nor his companions on the previous voyage had seen it on this side. The island, being large, is divided into provinces. The part which we first touched at is called Haiti. Another province adjoining it, they called Shamana. And the next province is named Boio, where we are now. These provinces are again subdivided, for they are of great extent. Those who have seen the length of its coast state that it is 200 leagues long, and I myself should judge it not to be less than 150 leagues. As to its breadth, nothing is hitherto known. It is now 40 days since a caravel left us with the view of circumnavigating it and is not yet returned. The country is very remarkable and contains a vast number of large rivers and extensive chains of mountains with broad open valleys and the mountains are very high. It does not appear that the grass is ever cut throughout the year. I do not think that they have any winter in this part, for at Christmas were found many bird nests, some containing the young birds and others containing eggs. No four-footed animal has ever been seen in this or any of the other islands, except some dogs of various colors, as in our own country, but in shape like large house dogs, and also some little animals in color, size, and fur like a rabbit, with long tails and feet like those of a rat. These animals climb up the trees, and many who have tasted them say they are very good to eat. There are not any wild beasts. There are great numbers of small snakes and some lizards, but not many. For the Indians consider them as great a luxury as we do pheasants. They are of the same size as ours, but different in shape. In a small adjacent island, close by a harbor called Monte Cristo, where we stayed several days, our men saw an enormous kind of lizard, which they said was as large round as a calf, with a tail as long as a lance, which they often went out to kill. But Bulky as it was, it got into the sea so that they could not catch it. There are, both in this and the other islands, an infinite number of birds like those in our own country, and many others such as we had never seen. No kind of domestic fowl has been seen here, with the exception of some ducks in the houses in Zurukia. These ducks were larger than those of Spain, though smaller than geese very pretty, with flat crests, most of them as white as snow, but some black. We ran along the coast of this island nearly a hundred leagues, concluding that within this range we should find the spot where the admiral had left some of his men, and which we supposed to be about the middle of the coast. As we passed by the province called Shamana, 
we sent on shore one of the Indians who had been taken in the previous voyage, clothed and carrying some trifles, which the admiral had ordered to be given him. On that day died one of our sailors, a Biscayan, who had been wounded in the affray with the Caribbees when they were captured, as I have already described, through their want of caution. As we were proceeding along the coast, an opportunity was afforded for a boat to go on shore to bury him the boat being accompanied by two caravels to protect it. When they reached the shore, a great number of Indians came out to the boat, some of them wearing necklaces and earrings of gold, and expressed a wish to accompany the Spaniards to the ships. But our men refused to take them because they had not received permission from the admiral. When the Indians found that they would not take them, two of them got into a small canoe and went up to one of the caravels that had put into shore. They were received on board with great kindness and taken to the admiral's ship, where, through the medium of an interpreter, they related that a certain king had sent them to ascertain who we were and to invite us to land, adding that they had plenty of gold and also of provisions to which we should be welcome. The admiral desired that shirts and caps and other trifles should be given to each of them and said that as he was going to the place where Wakamari dwelt, he would not stop then, but that on a future day they would have an opportunity of seeing him. And with that, they departed. We continued our route till we came to an arbor called Monte Cristi, where we remained two days in order to observe the position of the land, for the admiral had an objection to the spot where his men had been left with the view of forming a station. We went on shore, therefore, to observe the formation of the land. There was a large river of excellent water close by, but the ground was inundated and very ill calculated for habitation. As we went on making our observations on the river and the land, some of our men found two dead bodies by the river's side, one with a rope round his neck and the other with one round his foot. This was on the first day of our landing. On the following day, they found two other corpses farther on, and one of these was observed to have a great quantity of beard. This was regarded as a very suspicious circumstance by many of our people because, as I have already said, all the Indians are beardless. This harbor is 12 leagues from the place where the Spaniards had been left under the protection of Wakamari, the king of that province, whom I suppose to be one of the chief men of the island. After two days, we set sail for that spot, but as it was late when we arrived, and there were some shoals where the admiral's ship had been lost, we did not venture to put in close to the shore, but remained that night at a little less than a league from the coast, waiting until the morning when we might enter securely. On that evening, a canoe containing five or six Indians came out at a considerable distance from where we were and approached us with great celerity. The admiral, believing that he ensured our safety by keeping the sails set, would not wait for them. They, however, perseveringly rode up to us within gunshot and then stopped to look at us. But when they saw that we did not wait for them, they put back and went away. After we had anchored that night at the spot in question, the admiral ordered two guns to be fired to see the Spaniards who had remained with Wakamari would fire in return, for they also had guns with them. But when we received no reply and could not perceive any fires, nor the slightest symptom of habitations on the spot, the spirits of our people became much depressed, and they began to entertain the suspicion which the circumstances were naturally calculated to excite. While all were in this desponding mood, and when four or five hours of the night had passed away, the same canoe which we had seen in the evening came up, and the Indians, with a loud voice, addressed the captain of the caravel, which they first approached, inquiring for the admiral. 
they were conducted to the admiral's vessel, but would not go on board till he had spoken to them, and they had asked for a light in order to assure themselves that it was he who conversed with them. One of them was a cousin of Wakamari, who had been sent by him once before. It appeared that after they had turned back the previous evening, they had been charged by Wakamari with two masks of gold as a present, one for the admiral, the other for a captain who had accompanied him on the former voyage. They remained on board for three hours, talking with the admiral in the presence of all of us, he showing much pleasure in their conversation and inquiring respecting the welfare of the Spaniards whom he had left behind. Well, Camari's cousin replied that those who remained were all well, but that some of them had died of disease and others had been killed in quarrels that had arisen amongst them. He said also that the province had been invaded by two kings named Kaunabo and Maireni, who had burned the habitations of the people, and that Wakamari was at some distance lying ill of a wound in his leg, which was the occasion of his not appearing, but that he would come on the next day. The Indians then departed, saying they would return on the following day with the said Wakamari, and left us consoled for that night. Next morning, we looked for Wakamari's arrival, and meanwhile, some of our men landed by command of the admiral and went to the spot where the Spaniards had formerly been. They found the building which they had inhabited and which they had in some degree fortified with a palisade, burnt and leveled with a ground. They found also some rags and stuffs which the Indians had brought to throw upon the house. They observed, too, that the Indians who were seen near the spot looked very shy and dared not approach, but on the contrary, fled from them. This, we thought, did not look well, for the admiral had told us that in the former voyage, when he arrived at this place, so many came in canoes to see our people that there was no keeping them off. And as we now noticed that they were suspicious of us, it gave us a very unfavorable impression. We threw trifles, such as buttons and beads, towards them in order to conciliate them, but only four, a relation of Wakamari's and three others, took courage to enter the boat and were rowed on board. When they were asked concerning the Spaniards, they replied that all of them were dead. We had been told this already by one of the Indians whom we had brought from Spain and who had conversed with the two Indians that on the former occasion came on board with their canoe, but we had not believed it. Wakamari's kinsman was asked who had killed them. He replied that King Kaunabo and King Maireni had made an attack upon them and burnt the buildings on the spot, that many were wounded in the affray, and among them Wakamari, who had received a wound in his thigh and had retired to some distance. He also stated that he wished to go and fetch him, upon which some trifles were given to him, and he took his departure for the place of Wakamari's abode. All that day we remained in expectation of them, and when we saw that they did not come, many suspected that the Indians who had been on board the night before had been drowned, for they had had wine given them two or three times, and they had come in a small canoe that might be easily upset. The next morning, the admiral went on shore, taking some of us with him. We went to the spot where the settlement had been and found it utterly destroyed by fire and the clothes of the Spaniards lying about upon the grass. But on that occasion, we saw no dead body. There were many different opinions amongst us, some suspecting that Wakamari himself was concerned in the betrayal and death of the Christians. Others thought not because his own residence was burnt, so that it remained a very doubtful question. The admiral ordered all the ground which had been occupied by the fortifications of the Spaniards to be searched, for he had left orders with them to bury all the gold that they might get. 
While this was being done, the admiral wished to examine a spot at about a league's distance, which seemed to be suitable for building a town, for there was yet time to do so. And some of us went thither with him, making our observations of the land as we went along the coast, until we reached a village of seven or eight houses, which the Indians forsook when they saw us approach, carrying away what they could, and leaving the things which they could not remove, hidden amongst the grass around the houses. These people are so degraded that they have not even the sense to select a fitting place to live in. Those who dwell on the shore build for themselves the most miserable hovels that can be imagined, and all the houses are so covered with grass and dampness that I wonder how they can contrive to exist. In these houses, we found many things belonging to the Spaniards, which it could not be supposed they would have bartered, such as a very handsome Moorish mantle, which had not been unfolded since it was brought from Spain, stockings and pieces of cloth, also an anchor belonging to the ship, which the admiral had lost here on the previous voyage, with other articles, which the more confirmed our suspicions. On examining, some things which had been very cautiously sewn up in a small basket, we found a man's head wrapped up with great care. This, we judged, might be the head of a father or mother or of some person whom they much regarded. I have since heard that many were found in the same state, which makes me believe that our first impression was the true one. After this, we returned. We went on the same day to the site of the settlement, and when we arrived, we found many Indians who had regained their courage bartering gold with our men. They had bartered to the extent of a mark. We also learned that they had shown where the bodies of eleven of the dead Spaniards were laid, which were already covered with the grass that had grown over them, and they all with one voice asserted that Caunabo and Maireni had killed them. But, notwithstanding all this, we began to hear complaints that one of the Spaniards had taken three women to himself and another four, from whence we drew the inference that jealousy was the cause of the misfortune that had occurred. On the next morning, as no spot in that vicinity appeared suitable for our making a settlement, the admiral ordered a caravel to go in one direction to look for a convenient locality, while some of us went with him another way. In the course of our explorations, we discovered a harbor of great security, the neighborhood of which, so far as regarded the formation of the land, was excellent for habitation. But as it was far from any mine of gold, the proximity of which was very desirable, the admiral decided that we should settle in some spot which would give us greater certainty of attaining that object, provided the position of the land should prove equally convenient. On our return, we found the other caravel arrived, in which Melchior and four or five other trustworthy men had been exploring with a similar object. They reported that, as they went along the coast, a canoe came out to them containing two Indians, one of whom was the brother of Wakamari, and was recognized by a pilot who was in the caravel. When he questioned them as to their purpose, they replied that Wakamari sent to beg the Spaniards to come on shore, as he was residing near with as many as 50 families around him. The chief men of the party then went on shore in the boat and, proceeding to the place where Wakamari was, found him stretched on his bed, complaining of a severe wound. They conferred with him and inquired respecting the Spaniards. His reply was in accordance with the account already given by the others, that they had been killed by Caunabo and Maireni, who also had wounded him in the thigh. In confirmation of his assertion, 
he showed them the limb bound up, on seeing which they concluded that his statement was, was correct. At their departure, he gave to each of them a jewel of gold, according to his estimate of their respective merits. The Indians beat the gold into very thin plates in order to make masks of it and set it in a cement which they make for that purpose. Other ornaments they make of it to wear on the head and to hang in the ears and nostrils. And for these, also they require it to be thin. It is not the costliness of the gold that they value in their ornaments, but its showy appearance. Wakamari desired them, by signs as well as he was able, to tell the admiral that, as he was thus wounded, he prayed him to have the goodness to come to see him. The sailors told this to the admiral when he arrived, and he resolved to go the next morning, for the spot could be reached in three hours, being scarcely three leagues distance from the place where we were. But, as it would be the dinner hour when we arrived, we dined before we went on shore. After dinner, the admiral gave orders that all the captains should come with their barges to proceed to the shore, for already on that morning, previous to our departure, the aforesaid brother of Wakamari had come to speak to the admiral to urge his visit. Then the admiral went on shore, accompanied by all the principal officers, so richly dressed that they would have made a distinguished appearance even in our own chief cities. He took with him some articles as presents, having already received from Wakamari a certain quantity of gold, and it was reasonable that he should make a commensurate response to his acts and expressions of goodwill. Wakamari had also provided himself with a present. When we arrived, we found him stretched upon his bed, which was made of cotton network and, according to their costume, suspended. He did not arise, but from his bed made the best gesture of courtesy of which he was capable. He showed much feeling, with tears in his eyes, lamented the death of the Spaniards, and began by explaining to the best of his power how some died of disease. Others had gone to Caonabo in search of the mine of gold and had there been killed, and that the rest had been attacked and slain in their own town. According to the appearance of the dead bodies, it was not two months since this had happened. He then presented the admiral with eight marks and a half of gold, five or six hundred pieces of jewelry of various colors, and a cap with similar jewel work, which I think they must value very highly, because in it was a jewel which was presented with great reverence. It appears to me that these people put more value upon copper than gold. The surgeon of the fleet and myself being present, the admiral told Wakamari that we were skilled in the treatment of human disorders and wished that he would, he would show us his wound. He replied that he was willing, upon which I said it would be necessary that he should, if possible, go out of the house because we could not see well on account of the place being darkened by the throng of people. To this he consented, I think more from timidity than inclination, and left the house leaning on the arm of the admiral. After he was seated, the surgeon approached him and began to untie his bandage. Then he told the admiral that the wound was made with a siba, by which he meant with a stone. When the wound was uncovered, we went up to examine it. It is certain that there was no more wound on that leg than on the other, although he cunningly pretended that he pained him much. Ignorant as we were of the facts, it was impossible to come to a definite conclusion. There were certainly many proofs of an invasion by a hostile people, so that the admiral was at a loss what to do. He, with many others, thought, however, that for the present, 
and until they could ascertain the truth, they ought to conceal their distrust. For, after ascertaining it, they would be able to claim whatever indemnity they thought proper. That evening, Wakamari accompanied the admiral to the ships, and when they showed him the horses and other objects of interest, their novelty struck him with the greatest amazement. He took supper on board and returned that evening to his house. The admiral told him that he wished to settle there and to build houses, to which he assented, but said that the place was not wholesome because it was very damp, and so it most certainly was. All these passed through the interpretation of two of the Indians who had gone to Spain in the last voyage and who were the sole survivors of seven that had embarked with us. Five died on the voyage, and these but narrowly escaped. The next day, we anchored in that port. Wakamari sent to know when the admiral intended leaving and was told that he should do so on the morrow. The same day, Wakamari's brother and others with him came on board, bringing gold to barter. On the day of our departure also, they bartered a great quantity of gold. There were ten women on board of those which had been taken in the Caribbean islands, principally from Budenken. And it was observed that the brother of Wakamari spoke with them. We think that he told them to make an effort to escape that night, for certainly during our first sleep they dropped themselves quietly into the water and went on shore so that by the time they were missed they had reached such a distance that only four could be taken by the boats which went in pursuit, and these were secured when just leaving the water. They had to swim considerably more than half a league. The next morning, the admiral sent to desire that Wakamadi would cause search to be made for the women who had escaped in the night, and that he would send them back to the ships. When the messengers arrived, they found the place forsaken, and not a soul there. This made many openly declare their suspicions, but others said they might have removed to another village, as was their custom. That day we remained quiet because the weather was unfavorable for our departure. On the next morning, the admiral resolved that as the wind was adverse, it would be well to go with the boats to inspect a harbor on the coast at two leagues distance further up to see if the formation of the land was favorable for a settlement. And we went thither with all the ship's boats, leaving the ships in the harbor. As we moved along the coast, the people manifested a sense of insecurity. And when we reached the spot, to which we were bound, all the natives had fled. While we were walking about this place, we found an Indian stretched on the hillside close by the houses with a gaping wound in his shoulder caused by a dart, so that he had been disabled from fleeing any further. The natives of this island fight with sharp darts, which they discharge from crossbows in the same manner as boys in Spain shoot their small arrows, and which they send with considerable skill to a great distance. And certainly, upon an unarmed people, these weapons are calculated to do serious injury. The man told us that Kaunabo and his people had wounded him and burnt the houses of Wakamari. Thus we are still kept in uncertainty respecting the death of our people on account of the paucity of information on which to form an opinion and the conflicting and equivocal character of the evidence we have obtained. We did not find the position of the land in this port favorable for healthy habitation, and the admiral resolved upon returning along the upper coast by which we had come from Spain, because we had had tidings of gold in that direction. But the weather was so adverse that it cost more labor to sail 30 leagues in a backward direction than the whole voyage from Spain. So that, what with the country wind and the length of the passage, 
three months had elapsed before we set foot on land. It pleased God, however, that through the check upon our progress caused by contrary winds, we succeeded in finding the best and most suitable spot that we could have selected for a settlement, where there was an excellent harbor and abundance of fish, an article of which we stood in great need from the scarcity of meat. The fish caught here are very singular and more wholesome than those of Spain. The climate does not allow the fish to be kept from one day to another, for all animal food speedily becomes unwholesome on account of the alternate heat and damp. The land is very rich for all purposes. Near the harbor, there are two rivers, one large and another of moderate breadth somewhat near it. The water is of a very remarkable quality. On the bank of it is being built a city called Marta, one side of which is bound by the water with a ravine of cleft rock, so that at that part there is no need of fortification. The other half is girt with a plantation of trees so thick that a rabbit could scarcely pass through it, and so green that fire will never be able to burn it. A channel has been commenced for a branch of the river, which the managers say they will lead through the middle of the settlement and will place on it mills of all kinds requiring to be worked by water. Great quantities of vegetables have been planted, which certainly attain a more luxuriant growth here in eight days than they would in Spain in 20. We were frequently visited by numbers of Indians, among whom were some of their caciques or chiefs and many women. They all came loaded with ajes, a sort of turnip, very excellent for food, which we dressed in various ways. This food was so nutritious as to prove a great support to all of us after the privations we endured when at sea, which in truth were more severe than ever were suffered by man. And as we could not tell what weather it would please God to send us on our voyage, we were obliged to limit ourselves most rigorously with regard to food, in order that, at all events, we might at least have the means of supporting life. This aje, the Caribbean called nabi, and the Indians hage. The Indians barter gold, provisions, and everything they bring with them for tacks of laces, beads, and pins, and pieces of porringers and dishes. They all, as I have said, go naked as they were born, except the women of this island, who some of them wear a covering of cotton, which they bind round their hips, while others use grass and leaves of trees. When they wish to appear full-dressed, both men and women paint themselves, some black, others white, and various colors, in so many devices that the effect is very laughable. They share some parts of their heads, and in others wear long tufts of matted hair, which have an indescribably ridiculous appearance. In short, whatever would be looked upon in our country as characteristic of a madman is here regarded by the highest of the Indians as a mark of distinction. In our present position, we are in the neighborhood of many mines of gold, not one of which, we are told, is more than 20 or 25 leagues off. The Indians say that some of them are in Niti, in the possession of Gaonabo who killed the Christians. The others are in another place called Sibao, which, if it please God, we shall see with our eyes before many days are over. Indeed, we should go there at once, but that we have so many things to provide that we are not equal to it at present. One third of our people have fallen sick within the last four or five days, which I think has principally arisen from the toil and privations of the journey. Another cause has been the variableness of the climate, but I hope in our Lord that all will be restored to health. My idea of these people is, 
that if we could converse with them, they would all become converted. For they do whatever they see us do, making genuflections to the altars and at the Ave Maria and the other parts of the devotional service and making the signs of the cross. They all say that they wish to be Christians, although in truth they are idolaters. For in their houses they have many kinds of figures. When asked what such a figure was, they would reply, it is a thing of Turei by which they meant of heaven. I made a pretense of throwing them on the fire, which grieved them so that they began to weep. They believe that everything we bring comes from heaven and therefore call it to ray, which, as I have already said, means heaven in their language. The first day that I went on shore to sleep was the Lord's day. The little time that we have spent on land has been so much occupied in seeking for a fitting spot for the settlement and in providing necessaries that we have had little opportunity of becoming acquainted with the production of the soil. Yet, although the time has been so short, many marvelous things have been seen. We have met with trees bearing wool of a sufficiently fine quality according to the opinion of those who are acquainted with the art, to be woven into good cloth. There are so many of these trees that we might load the caravels with wool, although it is troublesome to collect, for the trees are very thorny. But some means may be easily found of overcoming this difficulty. There are also cotton trees as large as peach trees, which produce cotton in the greatest abundance. We found trees producing wax as good both in color and smell as beeswax, and equally useful for burning. Indeed, there is no great difference between them. There are vast numbers of trees which yield surprisingly fine turpentine, and a great abundance of tragicanth, also very good. We found other trees which I think bear nutmegs because the bark tastes and smells like that spice. But at present, there is no fruit on them. I saw one root of ginger, which an Indian wore hanging round his neck. There were also aloes, not like those which we have hitherto seen in Spain, but no doubt they are of the same kind as those used by our doctors. A sort of cinnamon also has been found, but to speak the truth, it is not so fine as that with which we are already acquainted in Spain. I do not know whether this arises from ignorance of the proper season to gather it, or whether the soil does not produce better. We have also seen some yellow myrabolans. At this season they are all lying under the trees and have a bitter flavor arising, I think, from the rottenness occasioned by the moisture of the ground. But the taste of such parts as have remained sound is that of the genuine Myrabolan. There is also very good mastic. None of the natives of these islands, as far as we have yet seen, possess any iron. They have, however, many tools, such as hatchets and axes, made of stone, which are so handsome and well finished that it is wonderful how they contrive to make them without the use of iron. Their food consists of bread made of the roots of a vegetable, which is between a tree and a vegetable, and the aje, which I have already described as being like the turnip in very good food. They use, to season it, a spice called aji, which they also eat with fish and such birds as they can catch, of the many kinds which abound in the island. They have, besides, a kind of grain like hazelnuts, very good to eat. They eat all the snakes and lizards and spiders and worms that they find upon the ground, so that, to my fancy, their bestiality is greater than that of any beast upon the face of the earth. The admiral had at one time determined to leave the search for the mines until he had first dispatched the ships which were to return to Spain, 
on account of the great sickness which had prevailed among the men. But afterwards, he resolved upon sending two bands under the command of two captains, the one to Sibao and the other to Niti, where I have already said Kaunabo lived. These parties went, one of them returning on the 20th and the other on the 21st of January. The party that went to Sibao saw gold in so many places that one scarcely dares state the fact for in truth they found it in more than 50 streamlets and rivers as well as upon their banks so that the captain said they had only to seek throughout that province and they would find as much as they wished he brought specimens from the different parts that is from the sand of the rivers and small springs it is thought that by digging as we know how it will be found in greater pieces for the Indians neither know how to dig nor have the means of digging more than a hand's depth. The other captain who went to Niti returned also with news of a great quantity of gold in three or four places, of which he likewise brought specimens. Thus, surely, their highnesses, the king and queen, may henceforth regard themselves as the most prosperous and wealthy sovereigns in the world. Never yet, since the creation, has such a thing been seen or read of. For, on the return of the ships from their next voyage, they will be able to carry back such a quantity of gold as will fill with amazement all who hear of it. Here I think I shall do well to break off my narrative. I think those who do not know me who hear these things may consider me prolix and somewhat an exaggerator. But God is my witness that I have not exceeded by one tittle the bounds of truth. The preceding is the translation of that part of Dr. Chanka's letter, which refers to intelligence respecting the Indies. The remainder of the letter does not bear upon the subject, but treats of private matters in which Dr. Chanka requests the interference and support of the chapter of Seville, or which city he was a native, in behalf of his family and property, which he had left in the said city. This letter reached Seville in the month of, the footnote says January, in the year 1493. So this concludes the reading of these two letters. I included here this image titled Discovery of America, Vespucci landing in America. It dates from the 1580s by the Netherlandish Mannerist artist working in Florence. His name is Jan van der Straat, also known as Stradanus. This is a drawing in pen and brown ink with brown washes, white highlights, and black chalk. I thought I'd bring this image here because even though it is made decades later, almost a century after the Columbus was writing. So in this image, you see Americo Vespucci, another European conqueror or settler who comes in. And in this scene, we see him arriving, finely dressed, almost like a pope and with a flag and his ships. And America is seen as this lush, idyllic place with merry, wondrous animals. For example, I don't know what this is or this one. It looks like a sloth, and this one looks like a like a deer or horse-like or mammoth. And America is depicted as a female who is lying on a hammock and is awakened and seems to be roused by the visit of these intruders. And it's interesting that she seems to be pointing to this scene over here in the center, which shows Amerindians in the Caribbean partaking of human flesh. And you can see the plume of smoke here rising to the air. And the image, this very much speaks about the image that Columbus began to make with his letters. He describes Amerindians in various ways. In this image, the qualities that someone in the West would consider good qualities are not highlighted. And the qualities that those in the West would consider to be backward or undesirable would be that Indigenous peoples are eaters of human flesh. 
in that they go about naked. And Christopher Columbus also criticized indigenous peoples for not even discerning well where to establish their cities. Remember that on page 52, we read that he said something like, these people are so degraded that they have not even the sense to select a fitting place to live in. Those who dwell on the shore build for themselves the most miserable hovels that can be imagined. And all the houses are so covered with grass and dampness that I wonder how they can contrive to exist. He criticized where they lived and their architecture as well. And yet this image does not show some of the other things that he also said, that Columbus said, for example, how he admired the jewels in gold especially that the Indians made. Some of the things that I'd like you to ponder upon would be this recurrent theme of Columbus complaining about the nakedness, the propensity to eat human flesh, and the inability, as he saw it, of indigenous peoples not being able to take advantage of the paradise in which they lived in because they had everything at their disposal and they chose not to do cities the way that Europeans would make them. So I'd like you to think about in the context of the 21st century when we are seeing environmental degradation, whether being naked is actually truly a bad thing. But also think about the idea of nakedness because I don't think indigenous peoples thought of themselves as being naked. In fact, Columbus talks about the jewels that they were, and even though he derides the way that they that the indigenous peoples in the Caribbean adorned their bodies, and because Columbus describes that there are instances in which indigenous peoples in the Caribbean seek to dress up for solemn occasions, and at that time they do so with paraphernalia that he describes as very vulgar. And he makes fun of the way that they style their hair and paint their bodies in different colors, which he says, he says, in short, whatever would be looked upon in our country as characteristic of a madman is here regarded by the highest of the Indians as a mark of distinction. So keep in mind this idea of relativism and try to see this from indigenous people's eyes because when we read the letters when we form the image of indigenous peoples from these letters we only hear from one side we only see it from christopher columbus's or european side european men the way that european men are seeing the situation we don't hear that perspective we do we never get to see the perspective of indigenous peoples we don't get to see what they have to say or what their impressions were of the Europeans themselves and, how, and the way that they are dressed. Clearly, this was the meeting place of two civilizations. And at this initial meeting, both sides were extremely curious of the other side. And also, while Columbus makes fun of some of the things that indigenous peoples do and, and uh, their costumes, for example, eating, and even though he's being nourished in large part by, by the food, and it's ironic that in his letters, Columbus is highlighting so much. These, he repeats it ad nauseum that indigenous peoples are eaters of human flesh, as clearly stated in this art, in this image. But he also says that they eat, on page 68, they eat all the snakes and lizards and spiders and worms that they find upon the ground so that, to my fancy, their bestiality is greater than that of any beast upon the face of the earth. He says that, but then he also admits that they eat various other types of things. For example, he says on page 68 also, their food consists of bread made of the roots of a vegetable, which is between a tree and a vegetable, and the aje, which I have already described as being like the turnip and very good food. Also on page 63, he says that indigenous peoples fed them in a time when they most needed it. He says they all came, on page 63, he says they all came loaded with ahis, a sort of turnip, very excellent food, which we dressed in various ways. This food was so nutritious as to prove a great support to all of us after the privations we endured when at sea. 
which in truth were more severe than ever were suffered by man. So at the same time that he's accepting these victuals, these foods that indigenous peoples are bringing so that they can nourish themselves, he's accusing them again and again of being eaters of human flesh. So think about the inconsistencies and think about what is Columbus's intention by highlighting this so much, but also perhaps more importantly, what has been the lasting effect? Because as I say, this image is made almost a century after those letters, and yet is very faithful to the way that Christopher Columbus describes at some points. It omits some of the other things that he talks about, including that they have other diets, that they have gold, an overabundance of gold, and also the bird, the, the different types of birds and trees. Here we only see one type of tree and just very few plants. So this image is only showing the people partaking in eating of human flesh, not any of the other things. And even the landscape is not showing the waterfalls, the trees and the flowers and the fruit and the bounty that all this land gives. And the way that indigenous peoples organize themselves is not showing any of that. It's only highlighted the very few, the same few points that continue to taint the way that we imagine the indigenous peoples to this day. Eaters of human flesh, naked, and in much need of civilization. But I'd like you to ponder upon the fact that even though, like, for example, she's uh, this woman representing America, and she's lying on a hammock, which in my opinion is one of the greatest inventions ever. I have several at home, and it's one of the best things to relax. So I want you to think of this notion that persisted, that is a direct result of these letters and of the way that these so-called, all these seamen from Europe are coming over to take over America. I want you to think of, of this idea that they, that they justify their, their coming over and taking from indigenous people so forcefully. They justify that by continuing to highlight what they, European men of the late 15th century and early 16th century and 16th century, so on, as describing indigenous peoples as, as needing salvation with technology from Europe and also with religion. And try to ponder upon the words that Christopher Columbus says, that he keeps saying that the indigenous peoples would be very much wanting to convert to Christianity. I don't know how anyone could say that because they clearly had their own religion. Indigenous peoples clearly had their own religion. In fact, uh, Christopher Columbus on page 65, he says that he took some of the idols that indigenous peoples worshiped. And he said, and Columbus says in this letter, they all say that they wish to be Christians, although in truth, they are idolaters for in their houses, they have many kinds of figures. And then later, I made the pretense of throwing them on the fire, which grieved them so that they began to weep. So it's irresponsible, to say the least, to think that you go to a place and everybody would be okay to convert to another religion they've never heard of. Would you want to convert to another religion just because another people came in and that was the latest thing that was coming into the shores? Or change you from your, if you're an atheist, to change you from that way or make you practice a religion even if you don't want to. So that's something to contend with. And the last point, th there's so many themes that we could study from these letters to get at the image that was created starting in 1492 of the indigenous people, m much of it persisting to this day, shockingly, but maybe it's not so shocking. I'd like to also point out how dismissive Europeans at this time are. These European men are at this time of indigenous people's sovereignty over their land and their own affairs. And one of the things that they do is that they profess that they are the discoverers of this place, which is extremely insulting given the fact that indigenous peoples already had a civilization going. It may not have been exactly like European. Why should it be? Uh, and to this day, uncontacted tribes refuse to, wear, to do the things that we do in the West. 
for example, where the clothing that we wear or have the type of consumption that we have or, or eat the, the foods that we eat, etc. They do their own thing. There's also this misguided idea that uncontacted tribes would like to be part of Western culture. I think that that's by people who would like to take the land that's still inhabited and used by uncontacted tribes and make them join Western civilization so that they can become workers also, in part. For example, on page 39, the letter says, all the above-mentioned islands were discovered in this voyage. So I don't know what he thought of the indigenous peoples. It's almost like indigenous peoples are not human or they don't count. And then on page 40, Columbus is describing all the islands and all the birds and all the plants and all the rivers and things that are in this land. And then based on the behavior of certain birds, he says, from which we all judged that there was land there still undiscovered. Now, undiscovered by whom? Obviously, only by Europeans, because indigenous peoples know that the land is there and know exactly what is in there. In fact, the letters emphasize how much the indigenous peoples are providing Europeans not only with food and gold, but also with information. And so that's just a little bit of food for thought. I hope you enjoyed the reading of these letters and that you ponder upon some of the topics that I suggested here and some that you come up with on your own.